think we can begin. So I'd like to begin by welcoming everyone here to, to Shita this afternoon and to this afternoon's talk titled How to Cultivate Mental Balance and Wellbeing. So I'm planning to speak for about an hour or maybe a little bit more and then have plenty of time for question and answer at the end of the session. And today's talk um, I'm basing on an article uh, called Mental Balance and Wellbeing, Building Bridges Between Buddhism and Western Psychology, an article written by well-known Buddhist Alan Wallace and well-known psychologist Shauna Shapiro. And in the article at the beginning it says, to help open up collaborative dialogue between Buddhism and Western psychology, this article introduces a fourfold model of well-being drawing from Buddhist teachings as well as Western psychology and research. So first off, what do we mean by well-being? If we're cultivating this mental balance and well-being, what do we mean by well-being? And here the article says, the goal of Buddhist practice is the realisation of a state of well-being that is not contingent on the presence of pleasurable stimuli, either external or internal. In this article, the well-being we are referring to is fundamentally different from hedonic well-being, which includes stimulus-driven pleasures of all kinds. So when we talk about well-being, we can say there really are these two types of well-being. There's the stimulus-driven well-being, which is generally our pleasurable experiences. That's a type of well-being. But here in this article, when they talk about cultivating well-being, they're talking about an inner well-being, um, what in Buddhism we often refer to as genuine happiness. And this is a state of well-being that's not, doesn't require any particular stimulus to be present. You can be in this state regardless of what is going on around you. And here at the, it says, below we present a heuristic model that proposes that well-being arises from a mind that is balanced in four ways, cognitively, attentionally, cognitive and affectively. So they're proposing in this article that if we want to achieve this state of uh, well-being, then there are four types of balance, of mental balance that we need to address and get into balance. And so what I'd like to do in today's talk is first introduce these four types of mental balance that are described in this uh, article and then also then go into each one of those four types and look at how, according to the article, we are now in a state of imbalance in each one of those areas and then how to correct that balance so that we can then achieve this state of well-being. And so the four here, the, what's called in the article cognitive balance, I call motivational balance because it's a little bit easier to understand. There's attentional balance, cognitive balance, and what the article refers to as affective balance, uh, more commonly referred to as emotional balance. So we'll be looking at each one of those in detail, and then also look at how uh, it's important to have an integrative approach, that if we really want to strive for this state of inner well-being, we need to address each one of these four areas. If we leave any one of them out, then, we're, then it's going to be difficult to achieve the state of well-being. And then the last, at the end, I'd like to talk about what's called cognitive fusion. This is a type of cognitive imbalance, and we'll look at how this uh, really creates a lot of problems for us now and how to overcome this, what's called cognitive fusion. And then, as I mentioned, we'll have time for question and answer at the end of the session. So just introducing the four types of balance that are mentioned in the article. The first one, cognitive or motivational balance, the article says it's a reality-based range of desires and aspirations oriented towards one's own and others' happiness. So this is setting up healthy aspirations and desires to strive for our own and others' genuine happiness and well-being. Then attentional balance is described as the ability to sustain a voluntary flow of attention with a quality of awareness that is suffused with ease, focus and clarity. In other words, attentional balance is to cultivate simply a calm, clear and focused mind. And then cognitive balance, it says, entails engaging with the world of experience 
without imposing assumptions or, on, or ideas on events and thereby misapprehending or distorting them. So cognitive balance is really all about seeing reality as it is, clearly, without projecting or distorting what we apprehend. And then finally, affective or emotional balance is, entails a freedom from excessive emotional vacillation, emotional apathy, and inappropriate emotions. So they're the four we're going to look at. So the article here, it says, the model is presented in a linear fashion beginning with cognitive balance. So in the article, they first talk about cognitive or, um, or motivational balance. And it says, cognitive balance precedes the other three in the process of cultivating mental well-being because this factor is what allows people to set intentions, goals, and priorities. In effect, cognitive processes set the course for the cultivation of the other three mental balances, meaning that first we need to make sure that we have healthy aspirations and motivations. Our direction that we want to go in is healthy, reality-based. If it's not, then the other three, we're probably not even going to have any interest in them. And even if we do, they're not going to go well because we're heading in the wrong direction. And then it says, attentional balance is the next mental factor discussed because attention is a necessary skill for achieving the final two factors, cognitive and affective balance. Without the ability to sustain attention, it is difficult to closely examine people's moment-to-moment -moment cognitive and affective processes. Cognitive and affective balance are presented subsequently as they can be most effectively achieved on the basis of the prior cultivation of cognitive and attentional balance. So if we want to cultivate this uh, cognitive and emotional balance, we need to have as a basis attentional balance. We need to have a calm, clear, focused mind. Because without a calm, clear, focused mind, we're not going to be able to effectively cultivate cognitive or emotional balance. And so we end up with this model here that first we have cognitive balance or motivational balance. On that basis, we cultivate attentional balance. With attentional balance, then we have a good basis for cultivating both cognitive and emotional balance. And those of you who are already uh, doing some Buddhist practices, then we can correlate these four types of balance with Buddhist practices. That a lot of the what's described here as motivational or cognitive balance is something that we would develop or cultivate in Buddhism within what's called the preliminary practices, the foundation practices. And then attentional balance is shamatha practice, the cultivating the calm, clear, focused mind. Cognitive balance correlates with vipassana practice or wisdom practice. And then emotional or affective balance is correlated with what's called compassion practice, developing loving kindness, compassion, and so forth. Now, in the article, it talks about imbalances in each one of those four areas. And here in the article, it describes imbalances as one of three types, either deficit, hyperactivity, or dysfunction. So deficit is meaning not enough. We don't have enough of it. Hyperactivity, too much. And dysfunction is the wrong type. So it goes to describe those imbalances in each one of those four areas, e either deficit, hyperactivity, dysfunction, and then how to correct those various imbalances. So first we start with motivational or cognitive balance. So here the article again says, cognitive or motivational balance is the first of the mental states discussed because it is central of its, its central importance to all other mental states. If one does not develop cognitive balance, i.e. a, a reality-based range of desires and aspirations oriented towards one's own and other's happiness, there will be little or no incentive to try to balance one's attentional, cognitive and affective faculties. So really we need to get this right first. We need to have reality-based aspirations and desires for our own and other's happiness. If we don't have that, then our, our aspirations and desires for happiness are not reality-based then probably we're not going to be interested in 
doing any of these others because we'd be just chasing after all these sense pleasures out there that seem to be giving us happiness. So let's have a look at how, in motivational balance, the three types of imbalance as described in the article. So deficit, not enough, it says a cognitive deficit occurs when people experience an apathetic loss of motivation for happiness and its causes. And this often happens, and probably we've experienced this from time to time, all of us, is that either we think that there's, not, there's not possible to achieve this state of genuine happiness, and so we have no desire because we think that's impossible, or even if it's possible, I don't have the ability to achieve that state. And so we have a loss of desire for happiness because we, we think we can't really get there. We can't achieve it. We don't have the ability. Hyperactivity, it says, cognitive hyperactivity is present when people fixate on obsessive goals that obscure the reality of the present. People are so caught up in craving and fantasies about the future, about their unfulfilled desires, that their senses are dulled as to what is happening here and now. And I think we're all guilty of this from time to time, is we're living in the future. We have this obsessive focus on the future, craving all of these things that we want in the future, and we're missing out on the present moment, which is the only time when things actually happen. So we, that's obscured to us. And then dysfunction, it says, finally, cognitive dysfunction sets in when people desire things that are detrimental to their own and others' well-being, and are indifferent to things that do contribute to their own and others' well-being. And this is uh, very nicely described uh, by great Indian Buddhist master Shanti Deva from the 8th century, and he says, and we can, I think, all relate to this very well, those desiring to escape from suffering hasten right toward their own misery, that we want to get out of suffering, but it seems like what we do, we just get more and more suffering. And then he says, and with the very desire for happiness, out of delusion, they destroy their own well-being as if it were the enemy. So even though we're desiring happiness, we don't know what it is, we don't know how to achieve it, and we often do things that not only don't get us towards happiness, it just creates more and more suffering for ourselves and the people around us. So there are the three types of imbalance here. How do we overcome those? The deficit hyperactivity dysfunction... So here, in overcoming motivational deficit, um, here it says remedy apathy by meditating on the realities of impermanence and suffering and the possibility of generating well-being by reflecting, for example, on the lives of those who have realised such fulfilment. So we often find that in our life, if we're stuck in some suffering, we feel like we're stuck. We feel like there's no way out of it and it's, this, is, this, this state is we're stuck and it seems to be ongoing. But if we reflect on impermanence, we reflect on that also our suffering experiences are transient, they will, come, they will change, then we won't feel so stuck because we'll know that things will change. Um, and also then to reflect on the fact that there, we see people around us who seem to have achieved or are heading towards this genuine happiness so we can see that it is actually possible. And that way we can overcome deficit. We can have an aspiration for happiness because we can see that no matter how much suffering we have now, it's not going to last, it's going to come to an end and there is a possibility of achieving happiness. And then hyperactivity, it says, remedy obsessive desire with the cultivation of contentment by reflecting on the transitory, unsatisfactory nature of hedonic pleasures. So again, we're hyperactivity, we're caught up in these obsessive desires and fantasies about all these sensory pleasures. So again, the remedy here, reflecting on impermanence, that these sensory pleasures are transient by nature. They will never last. They're never going to fulfil us and thereby release that craving and desire, and, develop, and then we can develop some contentment rather than chasing after all these sensory pleasures. So for both suffering and happiness, by reflecting on impermanence, it can be very helpful that they're both transitory. But to really um, have that motivational balance, we need to really look at the underlying causes of happiness and suffering. And that's what dysfunction, it says, how to overcome that. It says, 
remedy mistaken goals with the experiential recognition of the true causes of both suffering and well-being. Now many of us in the modern world are looking out there for the source of our happiness and also blaming things out there for the source of our suffering. So as long as we have that perspective, then we're not going to have motivational balance and we're just going to, as Shanti Davis says, we're just going to induce more and more suffering on ourselves and others. So we need to reflect on what is the real true cause of suffering and happiness. And so here we can talk about two perspectives. Now, many of us in the modern world have this perspective, the source of my suffering, the source of my happiness is out there in the world, i.e. what happens to us. Bad things happen to us, we suffer. Good things happen to us, we have happiness. And so therefore for us, for those of us who have that view, pleasure equals happiness and pain equals suffering. And then when, we ever face, when we're faced with difficult situations in our life, then we see them as problems, as suffering, and then we have aversion. And that just magnifies our suffering. So this perspective is all about what we can get from the world. Let's get more of those pleasurable experiences and let's avoid those unpleasurable experiences out there in the world. If we can really do that, then we'll really be happy and be free of suffering. But I think we know from our own experience, no matter how hard we try to do that, we still seem to encounter suffering, suffering, and we're still chasing after that elusive happiness. So maybe the answer is not out there. And so this article is saying that we need to reflect on what is the true cause of suffering, true cause of happiness. And certainly from a Buddhist perspective, it's not anywhere out there to be found. It lies within our own mind. So whether or not we have happiness or suffering is not so much about what happens to us, but how we respond to what happens to us. So therefore, pleasure does not equal happiness. Pain does not equal suffering. It's our, attach our, it's our attachment to pleasure and our aversion to pain that leads to suffering. So here's a nice quote. I don't know where the origin is, but that says, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. So yes, we will be faced with painful physical and mental experiences throughout our life from time to time. That's a fact. And Buddhism is not saying we can avoid that. We won't be able to. But the question is, will we suffer because of those painful experiences? That's up to us. It depends on how we respond to those painful experiences, whether we suffer or not. Now for us, by reacting to attachment to pleasure and aversion to pain, then we will suffer. But suffering is optional. It's up to us whether we suffer or not. So therefore, difficult situations from this perspective is not a problem. In fact, it's an opportunity. In fact, if we're honest with ourselves, when is the times in our life when we've most developed as a person? Is not when things were going well. Generally, if things go well in our life, we sort of float along and not really develop. It's only when we're challenged, when we're faced with difficult situations, that we develop and learn as a person. So this perspective is not so much about what we can get from the world, but what we can bring to the world. So therefore, what we can bring to the world is loving kindness and compassion. And so this is what, how to overcome this dysfunction, is to really understand that source of happiness, source of suffering lies within, lies within our own mind. And in that perspective, then we can really start to achieve this cognitive or motivational balance. We can have reality-based aspirations and desires for our own and others' happiness. So then the result of this is that the result of such cognitive balance, how to know if we're getting there, is that we should notice a decrease in interest in achieving an excess of things, such things as sensual pleasures, material acquisitions and social status, and a growing commitment to leading a meaningful and deeply satisfying life qualified by a growing sense of well-being, understanding and virtue. 
And this motivational balance very closely correlates in Buddhism with what's called renunciation. And renunciation is a very often misunderstood word in Buddhism. Because in Buddhism we talk about renunciation as the gateway to the Buddhist spiritual path, the door of entry. But then people think, well, okay, if I want to follow the Buddhist path, renounce, I need to give up all my pleasures, give up my money, give up my job, giving up going to nice restaurants, give up all those things. That's complete misunderstanding. Whether or not we have these things is not important. Again, it's our perspective, how we relate to these things. So renunciation is not about giving up money and pleasure and so forth. It's about giving up an unhealthy attitude towards those things. The attitude that says money, pleasure, praise and so forth is the source of my happiness and having attachment to those. That's what we need to give up. So this is how we can really cultivate this motivational balance. And then on that basis, then... We have reality-based aspirations and desires for happiness for our own and others. Now we can start to really cultivate attentional balance. And attentional balance here, it says, again, is a necessary skill for achieving cognitive and emotional balance. So this comes before cognitive and emotional balance. So what are the imbalances in attentional balance? So deficit with regard to attentional balance, it says... The article says, attentional deficit is characterised by the inability to focus vividly on a chosen object, i.e., in the technical term in Buddhism, is laxity. That means we're not able to see the object in front of us clearly. Maybe our mind is very dull and unclear. So that's deficit, not enough attention. Too much attention or hyperactivity is when the mind is excessively aroused resulting in compulsive distraction and agitation. In the technical term here in Buddhism is excitation. Our mind is scattered, agitated, distracted. And then dysfunction, it says attention is dysfunctional when people focus on things in afflictive ways, those that are not conducive to their own and others' well-being. That dysfunctional attention is actually corrected in the other three areas, So we don't need to worry about that here. So the two things, the two imbalances we need to correct with attention is deficit and hyperactivity or laxity and excitation or in other words, overcome dullness and distraction. How to do that? Um, The article says here, these imbalances are remedied through the cultivation of mindfulness which is defined in many Buddhist texts as sustained voluntary attention continuously focused on a familiar object without forgetfulness or distraction. And the second tool is what's called meta-attention. That's the psychological term. Um, In Buddhism, we often call that introspection. Uh, The ability to monitor the state of the mind, swiftly recognising whether one's attention has succumbed to either, either excitation or laxity. And so here, how to overcome these two imbalances? We need these two tools of mindfulness and metacognition or introspection. So mindfulness is simply our ability to hold the object, to focus on the object without becoming distracted. That's what mindfulness is. But then we need to monitor that. How are we going? Are we still focusing on the object or not? That's introspection. So introspection or metacognition is quality control, is monitoring the mindfulness. Are we still focusing on the object? Or are we starting to become dull or distracted? And if we become dull or distracted, then reapply mindfulness, hold the object again. So using these two tools, we can overcome both laxity and excitation. And it says here, when laxity sets in, the primary remedy is to arouse the attention by taking a fresh interest in the object of meditation. So, and you've probably experienced this as well in meditation, if you're simply maybe focusing on the breath, but then somehow you start to get very dull and sleepy and tired. Um, And generally the most common reason we do that is we've simply lost interest in the practice. You know, because this breath is so boring, isn't it? It's just so boring. Why am I focusing on the breath? And then we just get very dull and sleepy. So the remedy is 
if you find yourself not interested in the practice, develop interest because understanding that this practice, this attentional balance or shamatha practice, is the gateway to genuine happiness. And then you'll be very interested to practice. You'll be very interested to focus on the breath. So you uplift the mind. So you refresh your interest in the practice. Then you restore your attention on the object. And then you retain the flow of mindfulness of the object. Then the text says, and uh, the uh, article says, um, whereas when the mind becomes agitated, the first thing to do is to relax more deeply. In this way, the attentional balances of laxity and excitation may be overcome. So usually what happens in meditation, if, again, let's say we're focusing on the breath and we get really agitated and distracted, then usually what we do is we get frustrated that we get distracted and we think the reason I got distracted is I didn't hold the object tightly enough. So we come back and we clamp down harder on the object. We hold it much harder. But then, of course, that agitates the mind even more and the minds get scattered even more. And then we think, oh, I need to do even harder. And so when we do that, of course, we get very frustrated. We get very exhausted from meditation. And sometimes people even say they get headaches from meditating. It means we're way too tight, way too tense. We're simply trying too hard. So as the article recommends here, the first thing to do is to relax. So for attentional balance, we need to relax. So not to get uptight and tense and hold more tightly. So first, if we get distracted, relax. Then release the distraction and very gently return to focusing on the object. Relax, release, return. But then the question is, well, what object should we focus on? Because we're developing attentional balance. So we're focusing on an object. Now, according to Buddhism, we can focus on any one of many different objects. But probably the object that's most widely recommended in many Buddhist traditions is the breath. And so that's what's being mentioned here in this, in this article as well. It says, one of the most widespread Buddhist practices for developing attentional balance is mindfulness of breathing. In such practice, one may begin by focusing the attention on the tactile sensations of the respiration wherever they arise in the entire body. Um, one may then more narrowly focus on the sensations of the rise and fall of the abdomen of each in and out breath. So many Buddhist traditions focus there. And then it says in the most highly focused exercise, the attention may be directed to the sensations of the passage of the breath at the apertures of the nostrils, so focusing at the nostrils. But for many of us, if we start the breath practice and we've not done it before, I wouldn't recommend starting here because we have a habit in the modern world whenever we focus on anything, object or task, we apply tension because otherwise we feel like we're going to be distracted. And we know from our own experience, if we focus on an object or task with tension for a longer period of time, we become completely exhausted. So that's not the approach we want to do here. In fact, usually in our modern world, we're in one of two extremes. Either we're focused and tense, or we're relaxed and dull. So what we want to do here is combine those two, is to be relaxed and alert at the same time. That's something we're not familiar with. So generally, when we try to do this practice, we get alert, but we're tense. And then when we relax, we get dull. So we need to sort of balance that to, to be able to be very relaxed and at the same time alert. And so that's what's being mentioned here in the article. It says, in Buddhist attentional practice, one first emphasizes the cultivation of mental and physical relaxation. On that basis, attentional stability is highlighted. Stability means to be able to focus without becoming distracted. And then finally, one focus on the development of attentional vividness, meaning to focus on the object in a very clear way, so overcoming dullness. So what's saying here is that if we really want to develop this attentional balance, the first thing we need to do is to relax. If we don't have a relaxed body and mind, there is no way we're going to develop attentional stability and clarity. We're not going to be able to develop attentional balance because we're just going to 
get tight and agitated and frustrated and, and, and think we can't do it. So first relaxation, then we can work on overcoming distraction, developing stability, then finally clarity. And so if we do that training and then it says the result of such training is a state of attentional balance in which a high level of attentional arousal is maintained while remaining deeply relaxed and composed. So again, we want to be very relaxed and alert at the same time, not alert and tense as we normally are in daily life. For this reason, it is called meditative quiescence or the Sanskrit term is shamatha. The mind is now free of both attentional laxity and excitation and it can be used effectively for any, uh, any task to which it is put. So now with attentional stability, with, with that attentional balance, now we can effectively cultivate both cognitive and emotional balance. So let's have a look at what in, is involved in, in emotional and cognitive balance. So first, cognitive balance. So cognitive balance, it says, entails engaging with the world of experience without imposing conceptual assumptions or ideas on events and thereby misapprehending or distorting them. It therefore involves being calmly and clearly present with experience as it arises moment by moment. So what we're trying to do here is see reality as it is. To see clearly what's in front of us without projecting or distorting what we apprehend. But now we don't tend to have that cognitive balance. We fall into one of these three imbalances. That is, deficit for cognitive balance is it's that at times people are simply absent-minded, meaning cognitive deficit, we're not actually really seeing what's in front of us because we're either dull or absent-minded. We're not paying attention to what's in front of us. Hyperactivity, it says, on other occasions, they get caught up in their assumptions and expectations, failing to distinguish between perceived realities and their fantasies. So hyperactivity is we see things there, but then we project a lot of things on top of what's reality, project our expectations, our assumptions, our ideas on top of reality that's not there. And then dysfunction, it says, and they are generally prone to misapprehending events in a myriad of ways due to cognitive deficit and hyperactivity imbalances. So due to those two, then we misapprehend things in many different ways. And a very good example about how that happens in Buddhism is the example of uh, mistaken a coiled rope for a snake. So the Buddhist example is we're walking along a path, it's quite dark, and then next to the path there's something coiled up on the side of the path, but because we can't see clearly, we think it's a snake and we develop fear and run away. So here it says, um, because one does not initially perceive this object clearly, this is a cognitive deficit, so we don't actually see what's there, one is prone to projecting one's fears or expectations on the object, hyperactivity. So we're projecting fear because we think there's a snake there, resulting in a misidentification of the object. Again, hyperactivity, we think it's a snake, we develop fear. So that's a classic example of cognitive imbalance. So let's have a look at how to overcome that. How do we overcome these cognitive imbalances? It says, according to Buddhism, the distinguishing characteristic of what we are referring to as cognitive balance is that one views the world without the imbalances of cognitive hyperactivity, deficit or dysfunction. Overcoming such cognitive imbalances is a central theme in Buddhist practice, where one of the primary interventions is the application of discerning mindfulness to whatever arises moment to moment. So it says here, the faculty of mindfulness, as previously defined in attentional balance, is initially cultivated by means to overcome attentional imbalances, and then it is applied to daily experience in order to achieve cognitive balance. So when we talk about mindfulness, then we are cultivating that in the attentional balance or shamatha practice. We're strengthening that mindfulness. But then in, in uh, cognitive balance training or vipassana practice, we then apply that mindfulness 
to everyday experiences. And so that is the difference between cultivating mindfulness in attentional balance, applying mindfulness in cognitive balance. How do we do that? It says the four applications of mindfulness to the body, feelings, mental states and processes and phenomena in general constitute the most fundamental system of meditative practice in Buddhism for achieving insight by means of overcoming cognitive imbalances. So those of you particularly who've studied a little bit in the Theravada Buddhist traditions probably know about this very well in, in, in Vipassana practice, these four applications of mindfulness. Um, so those of you have probably done, many of you done a Goenka Vipassana retreat. So what are we doing in that Goenka Vipassana retreat? First four days, we are cultivating mindfulness, aren't we? Focusing anapanasati, focusing at the nostrils, developing it, because otherwise you won't be able to use it to apply it. So four days of cultivating mindfulness in Goenka, focusing here. Then the next four or five days, six days, you apply mindfulness in Vipassana practice. And what we do, because that's an entry-level retreat, you just focus on the first one of these four, the body. So you're focusing on the body, you're look, scanning through the body and noticing that the body is not some solid object, that it's just full of sensations, vibrations. And so actually you are overcoming primarily the first cognitive imbalance, which here is we see things which are changing as unchanging. That's the first cognitive imbalance we have now. And we're talking experientially. Intellectually... I think we all accept that everything's changing moment by moment. We've learned that, we all believe that. But is that our experience is based on that? No. Our experience is based on our instinctive habit. And instinctively, when we see things around us, instinctively, they don't seem like they're changing moment by moment. They seem like pretty solid. You know, this cup is the same cup that was here yesterday, it'll be the same cup here tomorrow. You know, my body's not really changing very much. And that's how we relate to our body and cups and things. That's cognitive imbalance. So what we want to do with this practice is experientially, not just intellectually, experientially see things as changing moment by moment. And that's what we're achieving in the Goenka retreat. You know, after some days of scanning the body, instead of seeing a single solid body here experientially, you just experience a flow of sensations. So that's overcoming cognitive imbalance, the first one, the body and that it's impermanent. Another uh, cognitive imbalance, we tend to see pleasure as happiness. Those pleasurable experiences, they're in the nature of happiness. But if we apply this mindfulness, we will come to see, as we saw in the motivational balance, that these pleasurable experiences are not in the nature of happiness. Because if our pleasurable experiences were in the nature of happiness, it would mean the more we engaged in them, the more happy we should become. But we know from our own experience that if we overindulge in our sensory pleasures, we don't become more happy, do we? We often have a lot of suffering, eating too much of our favourite dessert, staying too long out in the nice warm sunshine. They don't make us more happy, they just create suffering. So from that, we can really understand pleasure is not happiness, it's not in the nature of happiness. And then at a deeper level... Now we're grasping to self. There seems to be a self here, me, a, a me here, a real autonomous me here. And there's an independent world out there. But if we look here, where is this autonomous self to be found? There is no autonomous self here. And then we can overcome that. We can come to realise there's no autonomous me here. And then at the deepest level the cognitive imbalance we have is we see things which are dependent as independent. That experience, again, intellectually, I think pretty well most of us, or maybe all of us, intellectually accept the idea of things being interdependent. You know, we learned that, science has proven that. But instinctively, that's not how we see ourselves in the world. Instinctively, there seems to be an independent me here, there seems to be an independent objective world out there. And that's how we relate to the world. That's a cognitive imbalance. We're superimposing or projecting on this dependent world that it's independent. So by doing this sort of training here, we can come to experientially see 
Myself and the world, everything is dependent. Nothing exists independently. And then we can gain those insights and then we can really have that cognitive balance. And so then uh, it says, by means of such close attentiveness to one's interactive presence with other people and the environment at large, problems of cognitive deficit are overcome and by carefully observing what is perceptually presented to one's senses, one learns to distinguish between the contents of perception and the conceptual superimpositions that one projects on one's immediate experience of the world. So we can then really overcome those cognitive imbalances and then we can really see reality as it is without projecting or distorting what we apprehend. And then finally, emotional balance. Um, which here in the article is called affective balance. It says that entails a freedom from excessive emotional vacillation, emotional apathy and inappropriate emotions. So here again, three types of imbalance. So deficit with respect to emotional balance, it says an affective or emotional deficit disorder has the symptoms of emotional deadness within and a sense of cold indifference towards others. And we often end up in this deficit, particularly uh, as a, often we use this as a coping mechanism, that when we're faced with too, too much strong stimulus that overwhelms us, we cut from it, we cut. So then we become sort of emotionally dead, that nothing seems to affect us because at least then we don't get overwhelmed. But that's not a very good state to be in, this sense of emotional deadness and indifferent to others. And then hyperactivity is characterised by excessive elation and depression, hope and fear, adulation and contempt, and infatuation and aversion. This sort of constant oscillating between extremes of emotional reactions. And then dysfunction is, occurs when people's emotions are inappropriate to the circumstances at hand. For example, taking delight in someone else's misfortune or being disgruntled at others' success. So let's look at how we overcome that, how we can achieve motivational, sorry, emotional balance. So here it says, Buddhism treats affective or emotional balances with many specific methods for countering such mental afflictions such as craving, hostility, delusion, arrogance and envy. So we have all these mental afflictions, anger, jealousy, craving, anxiety and so forth. And so in Buddhism, we've got a number of ways of dealing with those. The, and the first step is to have a clear understanding of that mental affliction, how, what it is and how it leads to suffering. Because as long as you feel like, for example, craving and attachment actually is not a problem, it's actually giving me happiness, then, of course, we're just going to get overwhelmed by it. So if we can really, for example, see that craving and attachment is just bringing suffering, then we'll have an aspiration to overcome it and not get caught up in it. So once we have a clear understanding of these mental afflictions and how they cause suffering, the next step we saw back in motivational balance. That is, I think as long as we see the source of happiness and suffering out there, I think then we're stuck because we're going to continue to react to pleasant experiences with attachment. We're going to continue to react to unpleasant experience with aversion, hostility, anger and hatred and frustration and so forth. But if we can really cultivate this view of genuine happiness, which we do in the motivational balance, then we can see that the source of happiness and suffering lies within our own mind. Then, when a mental affliction like craving, attachment, jealousy, anger is arising, what to do? One thing we don't want to do is allow ourselves to get caught up in it. But the other thing we don't want to do is try and suppress it. That's not a solution. And if we've tried to do that, we know that maybe temporarily we can hold it down, but the more we suppress, the, it's like building up a pressure cooker. Eventually, it will explode and it'll be much worse. So they seem like they're the only two options for us now. Either we get caught up or we try and suppress. They're the two extremes we want to overcome. The middle way. What's the middle way between uh, getting caught up and suppressing is just observe. So again, to do that, 
We need mindfulness. If we don't have mindfulness from attentional stability, attentional balance, then we can say, well, I'm just going to watch them whenever they come up. No chance. No chance. Because as soon as they come up, our habit is we either follow or suppress. We'll just get caught up in suppression or following. So to break that cycle, we need mindfulness. Fortunately, we have cultivated that in attentional balance. So now, when it comes up, we can catch it before it takes control of our mind and we can simply observe it with mindfulness. And if you can observe that attachment or craving or jealousy as it's arising, you're free of it. You're free of it. Actually, objectively, if you look at what a thought or emotion or memory is from its own side, it's nothing. They're, they're virtually nothing. Thoughts, emotions and memories have no power to harm us from their own side. Zero power. They only have power if we give them power. And we give them power either by identifying with them and following them or trying to suppress them. Then they have a lot of power to harm us. But if we can step back and watch them, they have no power to harm us. And if we can step back and watch them, because every time we get caught up or we suppress, the habit of them coming up gets stronger and stronger and stronger. We're feeding them. When we step back and watch, we're not feeding. So they can't harm us and they'll dissipate and they'll keep dissipating. And we're not feeding the habit. So what you'll notice over time, your habit of getting angry, jealous or, or craving will get less and less and less and less because you're not feeding the habit anymore. And then on top of that, in addition to mindfulness, we can apply antidotes to mental afflictions. And they often come from the cognitive balance training. As we saw, impermanence. You know, if some mental affliction is arising, anger, we can look at it and go, well, this is changing moment by moment. It'll dissipate. And we can also, at a deeper level, apply the idea of dependent arising. So if we apply antidotes, that can also weaken them. So this is a very effective way at dealing with our mental afflictions, like craving, attachment, jealousy, and so forth. But then in addition, for emotional balance, Buddhism also talks about um, cultivating the qualities of loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy and equanimity because these are opposite to those mental afflictions. So if we cultivate these four qualities of loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy and equanimity, then instead of reacting with attachment and aversion and anger and so forth, we will be able to respond with loving kindness and compassion because we've cultivated those. They will become our habit, the habit of responding with loving kindness ra rather than, or responding with compassion rather than reacting with anger. But we need to cultivate them. And loving kindness in Sanskrit is Maitri and Pali Metta, and it's the wish for ourselves and others to be, have happiness in its causes. Compassion is the wish for ourselves and others to be free of suffering in its causes. Empathetic joy is really a rejoicing in our own and others' virtues and good fortune. It's a focusing on the positive aspects of ourselves and others. And equanimity is to really focus on the fact that, that to give up this attachment to friends and aversion to, to enemies, that we're all in the same situation. We're all stuck in the same situation. We all want to be happy. We all want to be free of suffering. And then develop this sense of closeness to everyone instead of having simply attachment to friends and, and, and aversion or anger and hatred to enemies and apathy to strangers. And so then by, by um, engaging in these sorts of practices, it says emotional balance is achieved when one has awareness of one's own and others' emotions, emotional triggers, emotional behaviours as they arise, and making wise choices while engaging with emotional experience. So emotional balance is not about withdrawing. Emotional balance is being about fully present in our experiences and not reacting with attachment and aversion, rather responding with loving kindness and compassion making wise choices. So we see here, for emotional balance, we also need this wisdom, we need the cognitive aspect as well. And so that completes the four um, types of mental balance. 
Two more uh, topics here briefly and then we'll have some Q&A. In the article also it talks about the importance of an integrated approach. You know, in the article it started by saying first motivational balance, then attentional balance, then cognitive and emotional balance. But here the article says, although we present the model in a linear process procession, we are not suggesting any kind of strict linearity among these four elements of mental balance. So it's not like, okay, first I need to sort out my motivational balance. I need to work on that. Forget about those other things, attentional, cognitive, emotional. I'm just working on emotional balance. Get that sorted, then I'll move on to attentional. If that's attitude, we're not going anywhere because we need an integrated approach. Yes, we need to maybe emphasise them in this order, but each one of these areas of balance, if we cultivate it, has a positive effect on the other three. So if we actually cultivate all four together, maybe not in the same practice, but each day, if we're cultivating each four, they will have a much stronger impact because each one will have a positive effect on the other three. And that's what it says here. All components of the model are interconnected. The model represents a systemic and dynamic process of evolving toward uh, well-being. Therefore, although we describe each of the mental balances below as individual factors, it is important to note that as balance is gained in one area, it affects the other three. So we saw there that, um, that if we leave out motivational balance, if we don't have that as the package, then probably we're not going to be interested in cultivating the other three. We'll be chasing after sense pleasures and so we need the motivational balance. And then the attentional balance is necessary because without attentional balance we saw that it's very difficult to develop cognitive or any of the other three balances because our mind is, is distracted and dull. So if we're trying to cultivate loving kindness and compassion, or we're trying to cultivate wisdom with a mind that is distracted or dull, they're not going to be effective. So we need attentional balance. We can't afford to leave that out. But then, um, but then also with the motivation, the cognitive and emotional balance, then we need those as well. Because if we, and this, what often happens here, and when we talk about cognitive and emotional balance, in, in Buddhism this is the vipassana and compassion practices. Or in other words, we can talk about the two main wings of practice of wisdom and compassion. They're the two main wings of, compassion, of practice. And unfortunately, what often happens is when people come into spiritual practice, they tend to gravitate towards one or the other. They tend to either like, you know, a lot of people hear that in Buddhism, Wisdom is necessary to achieve liberation. So they go, okay, I'm going to do the wisdom practice. I'm doing Vipassana practice. Compassion, uh, I'm not so interested in that. I'm just going to do Vipassana. Or as other people maybe have a very kind heart naturally and they gravitate towards loving kindness and compassion. They feel really resonate. I'm really going to put a lot of effort into loving kindness and compassion. Oh, that wisdom stuff, that's just too difficult. I'll, I'll sort of, maybe I'll do that later. If we have either of those two attitudes, we're in trouble. Because if you don't practice them integrated, you're going to have difficulties. For example, um, if you only do the wisdom side, the Vipassana, and forget about the loving kindness and compassion, then what we find is that people who do that often become very self-absorbed, they become very disconnected from the world, and they often become very insensitive to the sufferings of others. And in extreme cases, they become unethical because they think they're some sort of high-level Vipassana practice, uh, practitioner, you know. Everything I do is with wisdom, so, you know, I can do whatever I want. I'm beyond all of that ethical stuff. You know, in Buddhism, we, in, we, in Tibetan Buddhism, we hear about this crazy wisdom where people think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a really a wisdom Vipassana practitioner, high level, so I don't need to do that ethics, that's just for beginners, I can do whatever I want. So that's a big disaster. And then the other side of the page is some people who really gravitate to the, to the compassion side, you know, loving kindness and compassion, 
but forget about the wisdom, maybe they think it's too difficult or whatever, then um, what, what can happen is our, our compassion can become very biased. You know, I'll help these people because they're nice, friendly people, but these people over there, horrible, nasty people, I'm not going to help them. In fact, I hope they suffer because they deserve to suffer. So our compassion can become very biased. And then also, if we don't have wisdom, even if we try to help others, we end up maybe doing things that not only don't help but create harm because that's a lack of wisdom there, of knowing how to help others. And then you can also end up with, with, with what's, what's called compassion burnout. You know, we see this in... Um, aid workers, social workers, full of enthusiasm, full of compassion. They want to go out in the world, make a difference, and then often within three to six months, compassion burnout. Technically, there is no such thing actually as compassion burnout. Because compassion is the wish for ourselves and others to be free of suffering and its causes. You can't burn out with that. So what's commonly called compassion burnout, technically is actually empathy burnout is empathic distress. You have this empathy, you have this connection with suffering, but you don't see how to, to alleviate it, i.e. lack of wisdom. That's what burns us out. But unfortunately what happens is often people go into these situations full of compassion, they get burned out, they think, oh, this compassion doesn't work, I'm suffering. I give up on compassion. Tra that's ter tragedy. Compassion always works. What's not working there is lack of wisdom. You need to add wisdom. The wisdom of knowing when to rest and look after ourselves and the wisdom of, of knowing how to help and what we can do to help and what we can't do to help. So we just need to add wisdom to avoid that burnout. And then the last case I think we've all experienced many of times in our life. We try to help others and then they take advantage of us. And they keep taking advantage of us. And we suffer. And again, we think, this compassion doesn't work because I'm just suffering and we give up. Again, compassion always works. What's not working there is a lack of wisdom. Because if you allow someone to take advantage of you, that's not compassion. Because in some ways you're encouraging them to behave badly. That's the opposite of compassion. So what we need to do is add wisdom. And that is if you try to help someone and they're trying to take advantage of you, then you're very firm with that. You say, I will not tolerate that behaviour. That is completely unacceptable. Without getting angry and attacking them. And how to do that, we'll be looking at next. So then the last topic I'd like to talk about is an example of cognitive imbalance that I think is very prevalent for all of us and what it is and how to overcome it. And the technical term in psychology is called cognitive fusion. And I'll explain what that means shortly. But it, within that topic, I'd like to address a few questions. Is, first is, why do we get angry with others who behave badly? Particularly they, if they're behaving badly toward us. Why do we get angry? And why is it so difficult for us to have compassion for them? So in other words... How can we, in that situation, instead of getting angry, have compassion? And then the second thing I'd like to look at is, where does low self-esteem and self-hatred come from? Because it seems to be very epidemic in our modern world. And then how to overcome that low self-esteem. So let's have a look at the first one. Why do we get angry with others who behave badly? Oop. So first off, the, if someone's behaving badly, the correct perspective is there is a person engaging in a bad action or harmful behaviour. That's the correct perspective. But often when we see that situation, we don't have that perspective. Often our perspective is there's a bad person, there's a horrible person, there's a nasty person, an evil person. So what we've done there is we have fused the person to the behaviour. We've made them one thing. That's called cognitive fusion. And that's a false, invalid perspective. Because there are two things here. There's a person and their behaviour. They're not the same thing. And if we do this cognitive fusion, 
we're in trouble. Because in any given situation, you've got two choices, accept or reject. And generally, if someone's behaving badly, we reject. But what happens is, if we reject on the basis of cognitive fusion, because the thing we don't like is their behaviour, but we've stuck the behaviour to the person, so what happens is our rejection gets directed at the person. We reject the person because we've stuck them together. So we actually get angry at the person. We attack the person. But if we understand this is not helpful, well, the only other option is accept. So we've said reject. No, that doesn't work. Accept. But then we want to accept the person, but we've stuck the bad behaviour to the person. So accept actually means we accept the bad behaviour as well. So they're the two options available. We reject the person, attack the person, or we accept the bad behaviour. Both of these are not helpful. But they're the two choices we've got. And so we're sort of stuck in, those, in that situation. And it's even worse than that. Because then what happens is with that cognitive fusion, we end up judging and condemning the person because they're a bad, evil, horrible, nasty person. And then forgiveness or compassion becomes almost impossible because we want to forgive or have compassion for the person, but because we've stuck the bad behaviour to the person, it seems like we're, we're, we're having compassion, that we're saying that what they did is OK. Of course it's not OK. That's why we find that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to have forgiveness or compassion to the person if we do the cognitive fusion. In fact, we'll even go to the extent say, they don't deserve forgiveness or compassion because they're just such a horrible, nasty person. And then we end up with a fixed, biased view of that person because they're a bad person, which means it's hard for us to acknowledge anything good they do because bad people don't do good things. So if they do something good, we'll sort of brush it off and go, well, they didn't really mean to do that because they're just such a horrible, nasty, bad person. So we end up with a fixed, biased view of the person. And then, of course, this cognitive fusion leads to conflict because they're the bad guys over there. I'm part of the good guys. We're the good guys. They're the bad guys. Let's get rid of those bad guys over there. So we end up with conflict. So what's the solution to all of this? The solution is simply don't do cognitive fusion because it's a false, invalid perspective. Simply adopt the correct perspective. There is a person engaging in harmful behaviour. Because then we can accept the person, i.e. have forgiveness and compassion for the person, and at the same time not tolerate that negative behaviour, reject the negative behaviour, and help them to overcome that negative behaviour. And then we can have a balanced view of the person. Because we are all people who sometimes do good things and sometimes do bad things. And then instead of us versus them, good versus bad, it's us. We're all in the same situation. So if we don't do cognitive fusion, compassion becomes much easier and at the same time we're not tolerating the negative behaviour. Whereas if we do the cognitive fusion, then often we end up tolerating their negative behaviour because we have to accept that because we accept the person. Here we don't, need, we don't do that. In fact, we must not do that. We must not tolerate that negative behaviour. We must help them address that negative behaviour and at the same time have compassion for the person. And then lastly, and then we will go to some Q&A, where does low self-esteem and self-hatred come from? And it's the same thing. It's cognitive fusion. Because if we've done something harmful, the correct perspective is simply acknowledging, I did this harmful behaviour. I did this negative action. That's the correct perspective. But what do we do? I'm a bad person. I'm a horrible person. I'm a nasty person. And I think it's even worse than that in our modern world. So not only do we often have this cognitive fusion with respect to ourselves. But also in the modern world, we tend to have this obsessive focus on the negative. Obsessive focus on the negative. We see it in the media, everywhere. And even for ourselves, you know, um, if we've, let's say in, in a given day, at the end of the day, let's say that 95% of the things we did that day were really good. 
but 5% were not so good, what do we think? Oh, I'm such a horrible person today because we focus on that 5%. And then not only do we focus on the 5%, we do it with cognitive fusion. I was such a horrible person today. I was really nasty person today, bad person today. And again, then we've got two choices, accept or reject. And generally, again, negative behaviour, we reject. And so what do we do? We reject ourselves. We attack ourselves. We get angry at ourselves. And then we also have a lot of guilt. In fact, guilt... If, we, if we've done something harmful and we feel guilty, what are we focusing on? Bad me, bad me. So actually guilt comes from a false, invalid perspective. And guilt is completely useless. All it does is it paralyzes us and makes us feel bad. And it's not even addressing the negative behavior. In fact, uh, in Tibetan, there's no word for guilt. It doesn't exist in the Tibetan language. And, I've, and probably not in Sanskrit either. So it seems like it's a bit of a Western invention, this guilt trip. Because Unfortunately, I think, and we see this, there are various religious organisations and other organisations over the centuries who have used the guilt trip to have... Because if you can put guilt on people, you can have power over people. And unfortunately, it's been used in that way to have power over people. So we never need to feel guilty about anything because it's coming from a false, invalid perspective. And then, of course, what we do is when we do the cognitive fusion, we judge ourselves, we criticize ourselves, we attack ourselves, we condemn ourselves, we have a lot of self hatred because I'm just such a horrible, nasty person. And then we have a fixed, biased view of ourselves, then, of course, naturally, low self esteem will follow. So, how do we overcome low self esteem, self hatred, and, and so forth? Do we simply focus on the positives? That's a start to also focus on the positive. But if we focus on the positives with cognitive fusion, we're also going to be in problem. So some, I think some modern therapies actually sort of do this a little bit. They say, you know, reinforce, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. That's not really the solution because that's still cognitive fusion. Because if you do that... Okay, you're not focusing on the negative. But then you might think, oh, yeah, I'm a good person. And then you may sort of ignore your negative things you do, not pay attention to them, because I'm a good person. And then, actually, I'm a very good person. In fact, I'm special. I'm better than everyone else. So they can become a big ego trip, thinking we're better than everyone else. So this is not really the solution. The solution is, again, stop doing cognitive fusion because it's a false, invalid perspective. Simply acknowledge, I did this, I engaged in this harmful behaviour. Then we can accept ourselves, not reject ourselves, not attack ourselves, not get angry at ourselves. We can have compassion for ourselves and at the same time not tolerate our negative behaviour, reject it outright. Say, that behaviour is not acceptable, I'm not going to do that again. And so then that's the difference between regret and guilt. Guilt comes from cognitive fusion. All it does is it paralyzes us, makes us feel bad. It's not even addressing negative behavior. Whereas if we've done something harmful and we regret, what are we regretting? The behavior. So regret comes from a correct perspective and regret is very useful because it helps us to overcome that negative behavior. So we can have forgiveness and compassion for ourselves, we can still have good self-esteem, a balanced view of ourselves, and still working to overcome our negative behaviour. So that's all I wanted to talk about. So we've got 15 or 20 minutes. So any questions about anything from today's class? Yeah. Would make, make it a home run. Home run. And my goal is to make it. Would be if there was some ideally quantitative study that supports that going to more regions is actually better on the promise of more sustainable energy. Mm. Is there? Uh, 
Um, I don't know, but there is now, based on this four, state, four model, there's a six model being developed, and I think they're going to do some studies on that. I, I believe so. Um, the first question is, I mentioned that the motivational balance in Buddhism, that's more largely covered in what's called the preliminary practices. Um, and so certainly within um, Tibetan Buddhism, but I think in other t Buddhist traditions as well, they would include things like reflecting on the precious human life, that you've got a life of full of opportunity, reflecting on death, saying that you know, this life, precious opportunity is not going to last forever, so let's make our life meaningful while we've got an opportunity. Because often what happens is we don't, we don't tend to appreciate something until we've lost it or about to lose it. So often people don't really appreciate the opportunity they have to make their life meaningful until much later in their life. They look back on their life and go, wow, I, I really wasted a lot of my life. Because it's only when they're faced when they come face to face with death, that it sort of prompts them to. So we can do that right now, we don't have to wait. Um, so those two really help us to just have the aspiration, I want to make my life meaningful. But then how to make my life meaningful, um, the next preliminary is really reflecting on causality, i.e. harmful behaviour leads to suffering, virtuous behaviour leads to happiness. So basically adopting an ethical lifestyle. So all Buddhist traditions, the foundation is ethics. And I think any meaningful lifestyle, forget spiritual or not, has to be based on ethics. I think it would be difficult to have a meaningful life without having an ethical basis. And then the, at a deeper level, the, the fourth of the what's called the common preliminaries is this a little bit this reflection on what are the true causes of happiness, what are the true causes of suffering, to really see that there's no happiness to be found out there in the world, that... The, 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 the happiness lies within, the, and the source of suffering is not out there. The source of suffering lies within our mind. It's not what happens to us, how we respond. It's these, these mental afflictions, and particularly in Buddhism, there's a lot of focus on, you know, that to see that attachment to pleasant, aversion to unpleasant, this is really the source of suffering. But at the deeper level than that, why do I have attachment to pleasant? Why do I have aversion to unpleasant? then we investigate a little bit more deeply and we come to see that it's our distorted view of reality, this cognitive imbalance that believes that there's an independent me here and an independent objective world out there. That, what we call fundamental ignorance, that is the root cause of, of mental afflictions and our suffering. And so once we understand that and we understand that we can overcome that, then we have motivational balance because when we, we, then we, we can see that liberation from suffering is, is possible, then we would develop this, what I call renunciation, which actually is just simply the wish for liberation from suffering. So those four common preliminaries are very much emphasised in all the, Buddhist, all the Tibetan Buddhist traditions and also I think in others. And so that would be how we would then uh, achieve this motivational balance. And the second question was... So um, when we talk about practice, any practice, any practice always has two parts. You know, often, sometimes I hear Buddhist people speaking, they go, oh, when do you do your practice? And one will say, oh, I do it every morning at 6.30 for an hour. If that's our idea of practice, we're not going anywhere. Uh, practice is 24-7, at least from waking up to going to sleep, at least that. That's practice. So practice has two parts. All practices, all these areas, motivational, cognitive, attentional, all of these, have, all Buddhist practices have two parts. Meditation, formal meditation, and then what you do outside of meditation. If you're not addressing that, then um, you're not going to really go anywhere. And that's what often happens is, uh, I find, is some people really put a lot of time into formal meditation practice, maybe one, two, three hours a day, and they're wondering why they're not making any progress. And then you look at what they're doing for the rest of the day, it's not supporting that. They're running around, reacting. And so, you know, even if you do two hours of 
really good meditation, but then 14 hours of running around reacting with attachment, aversion, jealousy, I mean, it's got, you're going backwards. So you need to make sure that whatever practice you do in meditation, you need to keep working on that through the day. That's practice. <laughs> we need, for attention and balance, we need a relaxed and alert mind. How do we relax? And, and it's actually quite tragic that many of us in the modern world don't know how to do that because our modern lifestyle is busy, 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 go, go, go. And now, particularly with, with phones and, and internet, I mean, the stim amount of stimulus we get every day is, is phenomenal, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, one thing that I can really recommend is uh, cut down screen time. I mean, screen time is a disaster. I mean, it's a disaster for attention, but it's also um, it's a disaster for the mental afflictions. Um, I saw they did a study recently, I think it was in the UK, of teenagers, and they mapped screen time, amount of screen time, versus rates of depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem. Direct correlation. More screen more anxiety, more depression, and, and well, I mean, we see it. Um, so for that reason alone, you know, we need to really, I mean, all this sort of click, 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 like, like, you know, I mean, it's an disa absolute disaster, you know. Um, so, yeah, that we can regulate. And um, we need to really then sort of manage our life a bit to, to really cut down the stimulus of, unnecessary stimulus. I mean, we're not talking about running away and hiding in a room all day. I mean, we need to function. But I think that's what we come back on this idea of the preliminaries, that as long as we think the source of my happiness is out there or on the screen or something, then we're, we're, we're doomed. We're not, gonna, we're not going to shift anything. We're not going to relax because we're going to put all of our time and energy there. That's why it's preliminaries. That's the foundation. That's why motivational balance comes first. If we don't make that shift in perspective, then you won't be able to develop relaxation for attentional balance because you, your mind will be agitated, still chasing after all that stuff. That's why it came first. So if we've, if we've worked on that, then we can start to work on the attentional. We can start to relax because we've shifted our priorities in life we're redirecting and so forth, then we've got a chance. But what I really can recommend is many of us have had years of bombarding and our minds and our bodies are just, is just completely out of balance. Um, for that, I would highly recommend for meditating using the Shavasana posture. Shavasana posture is, is perfect for relaxation. But what we want to do with that is that uh, only use it for meditation because now we have a mental association. Horizontal means sleep. So if you try and meditate in the Shavasana posture, probably the first few times you do it, you'll get very drowsy very quick because you have a mental association. When the body's horizontal, that's sleep time. But if you use, uh, if you use the Shavasana posture only for meditation, you'll start to build up a mental association. And then with that, you can really relax the body and then just keep releasing in the mind. So I use that meditation posture quite a lot and I find it very helpful for releasing the tension. <coughs> reacting, yeah. 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 So I think the question is all about, you know, 
from this cognitive fusion discussion that if you see some bad behaviour, not to react with anger, but to respond with compassion, but how, how to do that, uh, yeah, in a practical way. Well, again, I think that uh, we need to cultivate mindfulness because we have this, this little window of opportunity from when, 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 when anger is arising until we react. Now, we don't have much mindfulness. So we see that and instantly we get angry and instantly we say something or do something. And so we can say, okay, I'm not going to react next time, but you will, you will. So two things we can do. One is work on cultivating mindfulness, improving mindfulness in the, in the attentional balance training, the shamatha practice. So you develop your, strengthen your mindfulness so that you can catch the anger earlier. Because now what happens is anger starts to arise, but it's already arising, and it's only when it gets to a certain level we notice it. But by then, it's already got control of our mind. So the trick is to catch it earlier. You know, maybe a little bit of tension in the body, and, but we need mindfulness to do that. So if we can cultivate mindfulness, we can catch it earlier. But what we can do is, and this is what Shanti Deva, who I quoted from in his text, he says, one very good thing to do, practical thing to do, he says, be like a, a piece of wood. Don't do anything. So what we can do, actually, is, in a practical way, take three deep breaths before you say or do anything. And then usually, if you do that, your anger would have subsided, then you're in control, and then instead of reacting with anger, now you can respond with compassion. Now, what we saw here is when we respond to com with compassion, we're not saying, we're not saying, you know, often people, compassion means, think, people think it means, oh, smile and say nice things to people. That's not compassion. Compassion actually is not an emotion, it's not a behaviour. Compassion is an aspiration, it's a wish. It's a wish for them to be free of suffering. So if they're behaving badly, compassion means help them to overcome that negative behaviour. But to do that, you need wisdom, we saw. Because without wisdom, you, you may say the wrong thing. You know, you, and sometimes wisdom might say, um, hang on, because this person maybe is in a rage. Wisdom says, no, no, don't say anything because whatever you say, it'll just make them more rage, more angry. Wisdom may say, okay, this, in this situation, I think the best thing to do is say nothing. Walk away and then come back later when they're calmed down and then talk to them. So basically there's no magic book that you can go to that says do this. What we have to do in any given situation is we have to evaluate every situation individually and then use the most compassion we have, the best wisdom we have, put them together and respond. That's all we can do. We can't do more than that. And sometimes respond may mean walk away and come back later. Sometimes it may mean say something quite strong to them. It may, but that's all we can do. And of course, we will make mistakes. If we demand that we want to have the right answer, we'll never respond because we'll never know if that's the right answer. All we can do is use compassion and wisdom, respond as best we can. If we make a mistake, we learn from that and we go, okay, next time I'll do different. That's all we can do. That's the... Yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. Sure. So exactly. So the the question is again similar to this is, um, and and. Actually, generally, when we use the word judge, we mean person. Judge the person rather than... That's cognitive fusion. So we never judge people. 
But if we don't do cognitive fusion, then we must not judge, evaluate behaviour. So judging people, leave, forget never, but evaluate behaviour. And again, all we can do is use our wisdom and compassion to evaluate that behaviour. And we may believe it to be unethical, and, but then also as part of that we can look at where that person is coming from their perspective, and try to see how they, they are seeing the situation as well. And then based on that, then we can respond in a certain way. But again, there's no right or right, there's no magic answer to any situation. But again, using wisdom and compassion, but not only our own, but we need to try to see how is that person seeing the situation. What is their perspective? That we need to take into account as well. And then we respond as best we can. And then I think instead of, I mean, maybe we don't agree, but if we have that approach, then maybe we don't agree, but usually there's less chance of conflict. Because if we have that compassion, even though we maybe use some strong words, that because those words are directed at the behaviour, not at the person, I think the person, if they're open, can sense that you're caring for them, but maybe they don't accept your advice. But at least they probably won't attack you because you're not attacking them. So that's a big difference. So we need to be careful on the, how we use the words. We, we, when we are talking, just simply address behaviour. And you can even, you, like, like, the, like an example, the wrong thing to do is if someone's behaving badly, saying, you're a bad person. Better, you did a bad behaviour. But still, even though you might say you did a bad behaviour, that person's probably doing cognitive fusion, and even though you said you did a bad behaviour, they're thinking, oh, they think I'm a bad person. So better than you did a bad behaviour, just say, do you realise that behaviour is harmful? Leave out the agent. Just say, do you realise... That, that, that behaviour is, is, is harmful for this and this reason. Then you're not even including them in that discussion. Just the, you're just talking about behaviour. The more you can do that, the less likely conflict. Of course, you can never guarantee, but that's all we can do. Yeah, but again, you... Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, I mean, there are some behaviours that are unethical and some, you know, so regardless of how you see it, they're unethical. So we need to see. I mean, there are some also cultural considerations. You know, in some certain cultures, something is unethical, in others it's not. So we have to take that into account as well. That's all we can do. Yeah. Oh, and then last question. Let me for, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, go on. Emotional healing. Exactly. Yeah. So for instance, like from, from a Western perspective, um, if you're dealing with any kind of emotional issue, um, usually we go back in the past or the history, um, any kinds of things that happened with the child, and it'd be brought up and tried to kind of like heal that in a way. And I was wondering what could be you know, a good perspective on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so emotional healing, I mean yeah, I mean, in Buddhism, of course, um, a lot of our emotional suffering is simply not acknowledging, suppressing things from the past. Um, and so, with attentional training, balance, then what we're doing is we're not suppressing. So, the more we do that, the more you'll find things come up from the past and so forth. Um, and then you simply acknowledge it and not identify with it because then you'll just, you know, hold on to it. So, again, if we're not doing the cognitive fusion and we allow it to come up, it's just, it's just something in space there and you just acknowledge that. And so that can really start the healing process. But I think that certainly in, you know, when we talk about dealing with shadow issues and so forth, I think the, the standard Buddhist techniques don't really have specialised techniques for that. So I think there, a lot of the modern psychology therapies are much better equipped 
to deal with those sort of things. Um, you know, often uh, the relationship between psychology and Buddhism, uh, very simplistically, uh, not that I know much about psychology, but I, I say that, like, um, the, the job of psychology is to make an unhealthy ego healthy. The job of Buddhism is to transcend the ego. So Buddhism doesn't... When you've got a very unhealthy state, you know, psychosis and so forth, it's very hard to use the standard Buddhist practices. So therefore, fortunately, there are a lot of stepping stones within psychology who are using also a lot more mindfulness-based techniques for working with depression, anxiety and PTSD and so forth that can really help bring people up to that level of mental health where you can use these directly. Last question, then we need to stop. So the question is basically, you know, we talked about how attentional balance training is really the basis of both cognitive and emotional. And in Buddhism, the cognitive is the vipassana, what's called vipassana practice, and the attentional is shamatha practice. So the question is really how much of this attention or shamatha do we need as a good basis for doing the vipassana? Um, of course, more is better, but I think here... What can be very helpful in the Buddhist context is if you have a teacher, a qualified teacher, they can more help fine-tune that. But um, I think we can just sort of, from our own experience, we can see how is our Vipassana practice going. Am I really starting to, to penetrate or am I sort of like a bit distracted and dull and so forth? And then we can sort of go back and do a little bit more. And I think it's not like a, a strict formula. It's not like we need to do X amount of this and then Y amount of this. I think you can, you can because it, it'll vary. Some days you may find your mind is more focused and uh, uh, very quickly. Then with a little bit of the shamatha, you can then go in Vipassana and be more effective. On other days, your mind is really quite scattered and dull. Then you may find, well, there's not much point in going into that Let's spend more time in calming and focusing the mind. So I think we can sort of adjust that formula from day to day depending on what's going on in our mind as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, run over time there. So thank you very much for coming this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed the talk.